Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Al Nakash, I work in Ulix Supercomputing Center. I'm from another center of excellence, ECAM, where I'm the software manager, but I'm going to talk today about something that's kind of a side project for me, maybe, or I'm not even heavily involved, to be honest, I'm more of an advocate than an expert, so you'll have to bear with me in my presentation today. Um, I'm going to introduce the organization, Software Carpentry, or at least some of the ideas behind that organization. Um, the mission statement for, for what's now the carpentry, it used to be software carpentry, and then it became software carpentry and data carpentry, and now they've combined back together again, and they're called the carpentries. Um, so their mission is to make researchers in, in science, engineering, and medicine uh, more productive by teaching them the basic lab skills for scientific computing. Um, so what we see is that m more and more scientists are using simulation as their laboratory, um, but not necessarily with all the skills that they need to use that laboratory effectively. And so Software Carpentry tries to improve that situation. So the problem, in general, like I just said, is that scientists spend more and more time building and using software, um, but the vast majority are self-taught. Um, they don't get formal um, instruction on, on, on doing this, so they actually teach, they have to go and figure out how to do it themselves or teach themselves. Can somebody open the door for to somebody just walking around outside? Um, so, and, and of course, because of that, then it, well, in general also, it's very hard to measure how well they're actually doing things. So how do you measure prog productivity in that kind of environment? Um, anecdotal evidence says that they're not doing very well, right? So that they, they're not very well informed about approaches to, you know, c computer science, best practices, and things like that. The solution, or at least the carpentry solution to this, is to actually, is to do peer instruction, so to get scientists to teach scientists the right way to do things. Um, the, the way they do it is, on, is in a two-day workshop uh, of hands-on learning. They cover four things that have specific tools connected to them, but actually what they really want to do is teach the thinking behind those tools. Um, so the first is the Unix shell, but really the idea there is to teach people how to automate rep repetitive tasks. Git and GitHub, um, but then there the idea is to track your own work and then to, to share work with other people. Python or R, with the idea behind that being to teach people how to write modular code. And then SQL is how to manage data. So, so why do it in workshops? Why not just create a big MOOC or something like that? Um, typically because scientists actually don't know, because they don't know the questions to ask. They're novices, true novices, and they're not aware of what questions they should ask. And even if they see a useful answer, they, even if they find a useful answer, they might not recognize it. Uh, most of the online tutorials are not aimed at scientists, they're aimed at commercial developers, and so they're not necessarily useful to the scientific space, or maybe they go too far into areas that are not relevant. And then there's a lot of HPC-related material online, but typically they ignore a lot of the prerequisite skills that are required to, to use that material. Um, the, the general outcomes from the workshops that they have is it's very common to see, to say, a 10, 10 to 20 percent improvement in the productivity of the people who attend the workshops. Ten times improvement is not rare. I mean, basically, if you're automating, if you're automating tasks that they did manually in the past, there's a big scope for improvement. And um, so that's basically it, doing the old things faster. They can also, of course, then tackle new problems because they're aware of the cap new capabilities. Um, in theory, it also could prepare them or help prepare them to, for using HPC, for using the cloud or big data approaches. And then the, the, one of the big things is that it helps them to, to, to start doing open science. So publishing your work or, or some of your material on, on GitHub, the stuff that you're, you're, the code that you're writing, in effort, et cetera, that's open science, right? That's publicly available stuff. And um, as regards the details of software carpentry, all the material that they have is all, is all open access. It's all CC BY, so you're free to, uh, to, to, to take it modify it, reuse it uh, any way you want. All the instructors involved, they're all volunteers. Nobody gets paid except the people who are do from the organizational level. Um, the host site, so if you have a software carpentry workshop, the host site pays for the instructor travel and the accommodation of that instructor, which is, of course, just minimal costs. Um, there, if, you, if it's a software carpentry branded workshop, um, there's an administrative free fee to cover that organization. Um, 
but that's only if they're helping organize. You can, you're free to organize workshops yourself using the, all their materials and everything, and even bringing structures as long as you're paying for them. You just, if, just if, you, if they're helping to or, organize it, then there's, there's, there's a fee attached. Um, so just to kind of situate things a little bit, I want to talk about some of the principles that lie behind the organization a little bit. And so this is the idea, the, some of the principles of the computational thinking. There are seven big ideas that we'll, we'll just run through now, basically, because it's seeing them as a list is not very helpful. It's better to see them in with, with the examples that I give. Um, so the first principle is that everything is data, right? Papers are data, observations are data, Im images are data, and they're all just stored as a binary sequence on the computers, right? And they don't, it doesn't care. Um, source code is just text files. You can manipulate them like they're text files. A program in the memory is just bytes as well. And the manipulating that program is no different from the way you manipulate characters or, or pixels. Everything is data. Um, programming, did I skip one? Data is meaningless without interpretation, right? So for a given sequence of bytes, it can mean many different things. It depends on how you interpret it. So this sequence here is either the word data or a very big integer or an even bigger uh, float, or it's a bluish gray pixel that's a little bit transparent. Right? So it, it all depends on what the interpretation is. And it can be any number of things. It depends on, on how you interpret it. Because the computer itself, it doesn't understand. It just obeys what you tell it to do. Programming itself is all about creating abstractions. Um, the thing about we're all human, right? And unfortunately, we have a limited amount of short-term memory. We can hold roughly about seven things in our mind at any one time. And so we have to put the details of things into groups, and then groups of groups, and groups, and groups of groups, and so on, so that we can actually process information uh, in, within our short-term memory. And that's why programming languages exist, right? So the, the, all the features of programming languages is to help us make this grouping process easier. Uh, and it's about creating abstractions, where, especially where we want to separate the interface, which is what something does, uh, from the implementation, which is how it actually works, right? And you always want to, va to value clarity over cleverness. It's better to be clear than to be clever. So the other principle is that the models are for the computers, but the views are for people. So a model is just a representation that is easy for the computer to operate on, right? Um, a view is a display that people can understand. Right? So, and it, so you store models, but you show views. And it's very easy to see what I mean by that if you look at HTML, for example. So, so the model is like a tree. And the way HTML is stored, you have a body, you have headers, paragraphs. There might be emphasis within paragraphs, things like that. And it's stored like a tree. It's written like this. But the view that you get is a web page or whatever. Right? It's simple. And it also means something to you. Right? So when you read this, there's an interpretation that goes on in your head where you realize emphasis is actually has, it means something. It's, it's, a, uh, it's the way you read it changes based on how it looks. The fifth principle is that paranoia makes us productive uh, when we talk about programming. So the best way to improve, improve productivity is to improve the quality. So it, what, being paranoid, what that means is thinking about writing tests to clarify the meaning as well as to catch any errors. And when you write good tests, if you write really good tests, it's actually a manual for how to use the code that you're writing as well. Because you're basically telling people, that this is how I expect the code to be used, because this is how I test it. Right? So if you write really good tests, you're essentially writing documentation as well. Um, and then you should automate. Automate as much as possible. So try to reduce the, this, this amount of human error that you introduce in your code by automating as much as possible. Uh, the sixth principle is that algorithms beat hardware, right? So if you have a choice between new hardware or a, a, an algorithm that changes the order of your computation, you choose the algorithm first, right? So that's all, all, always been the case, and it always will be, um, that al better algorithms are better than better hardware. The, the last principle is that the tool shapes the hand. So basically, if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. Right, so, and if you get your hands on more tools that have more capabilities, then you will understand those tools and you'll be able to, you'll be able to either create new tools yourself or, 
or work with the tool that you have better when you understand how they work. Um, so I also wanted, to, Software Carpentry has been around for a long time. Actually, that's the next picture. It's been around for almost 20 years. It'll be an anniversary this year. Uh, this is at Los Alamos back in 1998. Um, so it wasn't an over, hasn't been an overnight success. It didn't just come into existence out of a, a black hole. Um, but it's been around for 20 years, and they've learned a lot of lessons over that time. And so here, here are the reason that they exist is because there are a small minority of scientists who can already use HPC, big cloud, the cloud, big data, all things like that. But everybody else is living in the slums. Right? And what we, what, the reason they exist is to try and move more people from this side of the page to the other. Right? So try and help people move up. The lessons that they've learned, uh, the first one is, is that most researchers see programming as a tax that they have to pay to do science. Right? So yeah, this is something I, I hear within my community. So it's, it's, it's a common thing, right? It's a tax. They see it as a tax, and that's the way they treat it as well, right? There's, no, there's little motivation to learn anything outside of what they really, really need to know to do their specific thing. <laughs> uh, lesson number two is they don't care about reproducibility. And the, there's a good reason for it. This gives an example of, of why that might be the case. So uh, in the 10 years between 1990 and 2000, there was, there was 5 million papers published. Only 100 were retracted for computational reasons. So the odds of retraction are just 1 in 50,000, which means that for the average paper, given that it takes about eight months to produce, reproducibility is worth about 115 seconds. So in the time it took you to look at this slide, you've, just, you've put in enough time to realize it's not worth your while. right? And that's it. And now you move on, you forget about reproducibility. So the way things stand at the moment, there is no value for a normal scientist in reproducibility. Now, unless for some reason that changes, that's, that's the case, right? You can, you're free to comment at any point if you, if you feel like it. Uh, lesson number three, uh, they care a lot about productivity. And I think everybody understands that. They're all interested in tackling new problems, not making old problems work better, things that they've already solved, right? And they care a lot about their careers, right? People are very worried. There's a, a very daunting and, and, and you know, disturbing fact in that uh, of, of people who engage in research, only about 1% will ever get a permanent position, right? And so, of course, everybody wants to be in that 1%, right? So they all care about their, their careers. Uh, lesson four, the curriculum is full there's not going to be space made for computational science in the curriculum until we reach the point where that is really critical. We're actually critical mass in there. So, so whenever you talk about introducing computer computational science more into, sci into science curricula, you have to ask, well, you've got to make room for it. You've got to cut something. What do we cut? And even if you said, oh, you know, you only just give a few minutes to it in every lecture, if it's five minutes per lecture over the course of a degree, that's four courses worth of material, right? which means you have to drop stuff, right? To introduce compu computational science into a degree program, you have to drop something. Um, so in, in this kind of space, what does winning actually look like? So if you look at, say, the number of reviewers per paper, or how papers are split across numbers of reviewers, there's roughly like two reviewers. For 10% of papers, there's two reviewers. For 40%, for there's three and four. Uh, for another 10%, there's five. And if we say we only want one reviewer to be a believer, so actually, I tried to, so I've taken all these slides from somebody else. I tried to figure out how they got these numbers exactly. I'm not sure. I said, <laughs> but anyway, we'll take, we'll take the point at the end that um, the probability of have, have for any given paper, the probability of having a single reviewer as a believer in this approach to reproducible science and, and to the, the software carpentry approach. You only need it, the probability is about 18.3 percent, which means that if you convince the mind of one in five scientists, you have a chance of affecting every, every statistically speaking, every paper that's published. Um, the lesson number five is that uh, details matter. So the details of exactly how you organize your workshops and what you put into them, 
they matter a lot to the impact, to, 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 to the result, right? So they, in terms of the impact of, to the participants and how effective the workshop it is overall. And it, I, for them, as far as I understand it, it's been a hard, hard learned lesson to figure out these things, right? That two days is an ideal period of time for, for a group of people. It's something that they can take from their normal work, their normal work day or work week or work month without having too large of an impact on what they need to do. Um, live coding is an important part of that. So there should be live coding in an event. Um, it's a very good idea to have people sign up in groups, so not as individuals, but as pairs or larger groups so that they can so that they can work together as a group as well, so that they learn together, right? It gives people motivation. Uh, charging a fee is a good idea because if you charge nothing, people see no value in what you give. Um, it, it doesn't have to be expensive. It's like, this, like it is for a shopping trolley, right? You give 50 cents for a shopping trolley, a shopping trolley is worth 70, 80 euros, right? You could go down and sell it for scrap. You couldn't, but you could try. Um, you could sell it for scrap for more than that. But that's not the point, right? People somehow see some value in returning that to get their 50 cents back. The same is kind of true here. You don't have to charge a large fee, but it helps to charge a fee. It, to charging a fee helps people to see value in what you do. Uh, sticky notes are really important. So why would sticky notes be important? They use, in software carpentry, they use two colors, right? A green sticky note and a red sticky note. Everybody, or at least almost everybody who comes to a workshop is like the people in this room. They all have laptops, right? So if you have a problem, uh, or well, typically during a workshop, people will ask, you know, is everybody okay? If you have a problem, you put a red sticker on the back of your, back of your laptop screen. If you don't have a problem, you put a green sticker. For the instructor, it, it's really easy to see very quickly who has a problem. And they don't have to keep their hand up for a very long period of time. So if you go to help somebody, they just leave the sticker there, they keep working away, and then you look around, you see, oh, this person has a problem, you go down and help them. Right? So they're very useful. It's, it's a, and it's also useful for another reason that I'll come back to in a little bit. The other thing is peer instructors. People who are in roughly the same position as the people in the room, who have, who have similar, similar requirements for the software that they use, and, it's, and similar background and experience as well. It really helps that you have peer instructors. Um, lesson number six, people need incentives. Uh, if, uh, for the, the more incentives that people have to learn, the more motivated they are, the, be the better the impact. So you can give them those incentives by telling them they're going to save the world, uh, by telling them it's defensive, that you know, we're definitely going to have an impact on all the papers, so you're going to require this, because reviewers are going to review you on this in the future, so it's like self-defense. Or maybe you just want to make new friends, maybe that's enough of a motivation for you, that you come along to workshop just to, just to make friends. Or maybe you want to teach, you want to become an instructor, and then knowing that in the process of becoming an instructor, you're actually going to learn a lot more about what it is you need to instruct. Um, and also just to boost your career. Maybe that's enough for people to say that this will, this will help you in your career. Uh, lesson seven, there's a lot we know that we don't know. Um, how do you actually measure a programmer's productivity? We don't know how to do that. How do we measure a scientist's productivity? We don't really know how to do that either. And these don't cancel out. So software carpentry would say that one of their biggest failings is that they have no way of making a systematic assessment of, of, of how people do after, after um, the, their input after a workshop. Uh, but there is a lot w that we do know. So there are a couple of books out there that are really useful. Um, one of them is about uh, how learning works, which is a kind of a reference text when you're trying to become an instructor in, in software soft with software carpentry. There's another book about making software. There's a recent book by one of the, by one of the main guys behind Software Carpenter, Greg Wilson which is uh, how to teach programming and other things. That's a free book as well. If you want to download it, I can give you a link later. Um, so what are the kind of things that we do know? Giving people sub goals does improve their performance. Um, practice works best for facts. Worked examples are for skills. So what do I mean by this? For example, if you want to learn how to submit a job on an HPC cluster, that's a fact, right? So repetition helps here. Repeat, 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 and then it will remember, right? But worked examples for skills. If you want to teach somebody to program, it's worked examples that you would do, not repetition. Right? So th this is, this is, these, these are research things. Um, and these, these are actually links in the presentation that you can go and, and find, find where they're discussed. Um, peer instruction beats a lecture. Uh, media first increases attention. This is to do with uh, 
uh, educating people in computer science in the first place. That if you do it with things like images and video and, and um, audio and things like that, and teach people how to program using these things, the data concepts are very easy for people to grasp, and that helps them with their retention because they don't have to worry about these kind of things. They just worry with the, with the flow. Um, lesson number nine, which is a sad truth, most people would rather fail than change. Uh, so most scientists treat research and teaching and on programming as most politicians treat research and climate change. They, it's too hard to change, so they don't want to know. Um, so they just pretend it doesn't exist, okay? Uh, lesson 10, o open isn't just for science. So the thing about the software carpentry is that all the lessons are also collaborative efforts, right? And, and so this pres the, I took these slides from software carpentry themselves. Um, this presentation is actually, uh, I think, like two or three years old. So at the time, there was 150 contributors. I would guess that there's actually quite a few more on that now. Um, and you can write lessons in the same way that you write software or that we do now do encyclopedias. It's the open collaboration that's really the revolution in this. Uh, so we as a group, or, or HBC in, in, maybe in general, um, what can we take from this? Well, we can take a lot, right? One of the things we can take is, is their teaching tips, right? So how do they teach? They have this model for, for what a learner is. It's called the, the Dreyfus model. And it has three levels. And basically, the first is the novice who doesn't know what to ask in the first place. The second is uh, where I would firmly put myself almost all the time, which is maybe a competent practitioner. You know, I'm reasonably confident of how things work, but I look up a lot of stuff. Um, and then an expert is the person who does it all day, every day, for a very long period of time. Right? In terms of the people who actually teach with software, software carpentry, who are they and why do they do it? Um, they're all scientists in various, various career stages and from a lot of different fields. Uh, most, if, uh, most are not computer scientists or not software engineers. They're, they're from various fields. Uh, they probably mostly see themselves as having conscious competence, uh, but they're still new enough to relate to the people who they're trying to instruct. So uh, many people follow this path once they get into the software carpentry organization of uh, first being a learner, then to help out in, in a workshop, and then actually trying to become an instructor themselves. Uh, for motivation, the, the, the motivation is the best predictor of learning. Right? So basically, the more, motivated, made, more, the more motivated people are to learn, the more likely they are to get something out of a workshop. So uh, you need to explain to them how these skills are going to help their research. You need to get people, to, or it's a good idea to get people to sign up in groups so that they have the support of the people that they know and they can learn together as a group. Um, it's good to follow learners' questions off the lesson, so, so when you have these breaks and things like that, to get an idea of how they feel about how things are going. And it's good to have helpers in the room as well, so not just one person up the front taking care of 40 people, but to have helpers as well who give individual assistance to people. Uh, the things that demotivate people, um, you definitely want to avoid crushing people's enthusiasm. Uh, there's something that was a, discussed for, was kind of there in principle from software carpentry and then discussed over quite a period of time and, and, and created was a code of conduct. It's important to have a code of conduct so that it's there, right? So that people are aware of what is okay uh, in the room and then, um, and, and, and there if it's needed as well, right? So, so basically it's a, it's a template that, that exists. You can go look at it and read it and then you just tell people that it exists and they should read it before, before they come to a workshop. It's basically telling them what they cannot do, uh, which is things like harass people or use bad language or you know, put nudie pictures up on a screen or something like that. That's not OK. Um, and it's that type of thing, right? Just letting people to know what's, what's, what's not OK in the room. And if something happens that is not OK, what's the process to report that and what kind of action will be taken on that? And it's true for the class, and it's also true for the community as well, right? this, this code of conduct. Um, when you're teaching people, you should avoid this the, the, the use of the word just. You just do this. You just do that. Right? Because for you, it's easy because you know how to do it. Right? For somebody who doesn't know how to do it, it's not just. There's a lot more to it than that. Right? So it, it, it's just a word that you should try and avoid when you're teaching people. Um, 
You should avoid cognitive overload because we all know that if you give people too much information, their head explodes. Uh, not true, right? But basically, what happens is they just stop listening, right? And, it, and their, their brain becomes a superconductor. Information comes in one ear and goes directly out the other ear. Um, and so, so don't do it. Um, don't give people too much information because at some point they will just stop listening to you. It just can't, can't, can't follow what you're saying. Um, and if you do come across a problem that somebody has that can't be fixed quickly and you know it, um, then have the person pair up with somebody else. Okay? So, 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 so don't hold the lesson for one person if, if, if it's not going to be productive. Um, just have them pair up with somebody else. Uh, active learning beats passive observation. So if you can, you should have learners type along as you teach, and you shouldn't really go a lot. You should try and, as much as possible not to go too long without having people do hands-on work. Right? Uh, feedback. So everybody needs to know where they are, and that includes the person who's actually given the instruction. So you can get real-time feedback with this OK and not OK, green sticker, red sticker th type of thing. Um, <coughs> also at the breaks, you can use the stickers to get people to write little notes. Um, green, on, on a green sticky, did I, what, what good thing did I do? On a red sticky, what bad thing did I do? Stick them on the table as you walk out the room to go for a coffee, right? And then as the instructor then can quickly go over the things and see what it is that they need to, that they need to think about when they come into the next session. And as an instructor, you should try and just respond to the feedback, right? You shouldn't just ignore it. Um, and even if that means actually teaching less than you intended to teach, right? And probably, maybe that's especially, right? Uh, for live coding, you shouldn't have slides. Uh, you should start with a blank window, or as blank as the window that they will have in front of them. So if you're starting from some kind of an example, that's OK, because that's what they have in front of them. But you should be in the same position as your learners. Um, Having to type, it stops you from racing your head. Because it's all very, you know, you understand everything, but other people are trying to read all those lines of code up on the screen. Um, so having you type actually slows you down as the instructor, which is a good thing. Uh, seeing you make mistakes gives them permission to make mistakes. And that's really important, right? Because otherwise, they might see you as a robot who's able to write thousands of lines without ever making a mistake. And no programmer is like that. People make typos all the time. Right? So it's good to make mistakes, because, also because they will see how you, how you diagnose the mistakes and how you fix them. So these are important aspects, too. Um, the pacing of how you do something, uh, you should be aware that people can't really concentrate for more than an hour. So each major topic is, uh, from the software carpentry side, it's caught up with about four or five half-hour chunks that are given over half a day. And then there's, there's two days, so there's four of those major topics. Uh, for each of the breaks, you should make sure and get them out of their seats, right? Don't leave them sitting in the chairs, because then it's not really a break. Another thing is that you shouldn't really teach alone. Um, you should always have, it's always really good to have two people, or more, ideally. Um, former learners are good people, local volunteers, other instructors, right? Two, two instructors. Uh, they're really useful as well to help people with just setting things up in general and to help them with problems uh, as, as the lesson goes on. They also uh, can help you by taking notes on Etherpad. So uh, does everyone know what the Etherpad is? It's basically just a, like a, a, a website essentially where you can, you can take joint notes. So you, everybody can take notes at the same time. So it's a shared system, uh, like a Google Doc effectively, uh, but a little, a little more basic. But it's, it's useful there for, for, to, have a, to have a helper to help you take notes there. And they can also provide feedback to the instructors. They can maybe see things that you can't see about people in the room and, and help provide feedback to you. From, from the learner's side, you should never learn alone. Um, you should encourage people to, to, to pair early and, and pair often. So if it's good to have people working in very small groups, which is just two or, or larger, Right, to, be, to, to, to work together. Um, use the Etherpad then for note taking and they can chat between themselves on the Etherpad without interrupting the class itself or the flow of the class. Um, use Git with people, which is good for collaboration, uh, if people are comfortable with it. Right? So if everybody's comfortable with it, then two people can collaborate through Git. 
Uh, you should know your audience. So you should know, the, know something about the people who are sitting in front of you when you give a class. Uh, so what Software Carpentry does is they have a pre-workshop survey, a survey that, uh, that helps the, the planning of the workshop in general. This, there's a lot of challenges that are set during the workshop to give them an idea of how things are going and that helps regulate the speed of the workshop itself. Um, and then they have a, a survey after the workshop finishes of the learners themselves. And then there's also a debriefing of the instructors as well that's reported back. Uh, and one of the things that, that I think there's an awful lot of value in from software capacity is that they actually, they actually do a lot of courses in instruct, training instructors. And uh, actually going through all these things and, and helping people over a two-day workshop to, to learn these methods and to help them implement them. It's a two-day class. I was actually involved in the, the first group that ever did that, which is probably a good few years ago now. I don't know exactly when. Um, and it introduces you to all these concepts, which is this ev evidence-based best practices of teaching, uh, how to create a positive environment for, the, for your learners. Um, it provides opportunities for you to practice because for me, especially when I went, when I went to that course, it was a bit intimidating because there was a lot of lecturers in the room who spend a lot of time teaching people. And I, I don't do that. Um, so I, I worked in user support at, at Ulick Supercomputing Center. I do a couple of training courses a year, but I don't do a lot. So there's not a, that was part of the reason I was there is because I don't have a lot of opportunity to, to, to get experience-based learning because I don't do a lot of teaching, right? I only do it a couple of times a year. This was a, a shortcut for me to help me figure out how to be better at giving these tutorials. I did that one in, in Canada, in Toronto, but they do with them in the UK, here, in the UK, as well. So, and that's, yeah, well, maybe I'll come to that a little bit at the end, but, but basically that's something I would like to see in this, in this, um, C, this CSA that we do, in this coordination and support action for the, ah. for the COEs that we, that we think about sending people to instructor training, right? Um, so, Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure how they do it. Like I say, everything that Software Carpenter does is open source. So they have all this material that they give to instructor and instructor training is also open source. It's, it's freely available. But the course itself is of a lot of value, right? It's one thing to read something on a web page or something. It's another thing to actually go through the experience. Um, so I, if you get the opportunity to do it, or if you're interested for some reason, I, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's a bit eye-opening. Um, it also helps you become integrated into that community a bit. You see or meet other people and you see the value in it. Um, and it prepares you for using these skills in, in workshops themselves. Uh, the other thing that you can help take from it is, is how to go about actually hosting a workshop. What are, what are good things that you need to know, the best practices that you could follow. Uh, the general format that they have, which is probably a good idea to copy, is, is roughly a max of 40 learners in the room with two instructors. It's a lot, yeah, it's a lot. But the idea is that you're not alone, right? So it's not one person with 40 people. It's two people that share the teaching load so that there's, you, know, you, can, you can switch and give people a break. Uh, and also you have ho local helpers as well. So the idea is that you have two instructors plus some local helpers as well to help you work the room. Um, if you have a lot of people who are interested, you could do parallel rooms, and then you can kind of split people according to the experience that they actually have. They have lots of recommendations on how, like lots of different things, right? So how do you actually do the seating in the room and all these things you need to remember, like that you have to have good Wi-Fi, you have to have lots of power plugs, you have to have uh, toilets that are unlocked, right? This has happened in the past, right? <laughs> um, but there are lots of, they have lots of little details that, that are a nice checklist to go through before you have a workshop. Um, and like I said, all of their stuff is freely available, so they have a template for their workshops as well, which is done on GitHub, which means you get a free website and everything, so you don't have to go create these things yourself. Um, you, can run a, you can run a workshop on your own, wherever you want, whenever you want, without a fee. There's no fee for, for using any materials or anything like that. Every, like I say, everything is CC BY. You're free to use it, you're free to modify it, it's all out there. Um, you can use the materials in your own courses or whatever you feel like, that's all okay. Uh, if you wanted to brand it as Software Carpentry, so if you want to use their name,
then you have to have, there are some requirements, you have to have at least one person who's a certified instructor. Uh, you have to cover the core topics, which is those four that I mentioned, the SQL, the Python, the, the Unix, and I can't remember the fourth one. Um, and, and then you can use their name and logo. But, but you can also hold a workshop without doing that, right? You don't need to use their name and logo. You can, you can take all their stuff uh, and use it for free. Um, the other thing, that the, the stuff that we can leverage from them is how they go about creating a lesson. Uh, so they have two repositories on GitHub. One is the template for a lesson, and one is an exa lesson example which kind of explains the template and what you put in there and how to use it. Uh, why, a why, why create a template for things? Well, it simplifies things for people who want to contribute. And it ensures also for the lessons that they're uniform in appearance and that, that they have the same kind of metadata and everything. Um, I, I can probably go through this pretty quickly, but how you actually, how you actually use it, you use GitHub import to create a new repo from this template. You clone it to your desktop. Um, you edit according to all the rules that are set out in the example to create your lesson. And then there's a, there's a check script there to make sure that everything's okay before you upload it. Um, why not just do forking? Uh, wh why, why do this, this GitHub import instead? It's because people may want to work on many lessons and you can only fork once. Um, so on GitHub, you can only make one fork of a repository, but you can import, uh, well, you can create as many pr uh, um, imports as you like. Um, so if people want to work on a few lessons, uh, just forking doesn't work. You need to use the import. Um, when you compare the template and the example, the, the template has all this, this, you know, the CSS and the tools and everything, and they might be updated centrally. So, so the example is, is just explanations of how things should be used, and they shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to edit all those to, to, um, to create your lesson. Um, the reasoning that they did this was because the separate, separate repositories are less confusing than having two branches in the main repo. It's easier to just give these two separate links. So yeah, again, you create the repository. It's not a fork. You use GitHub import with this URL, which is the, the, the template. Um, and then you give it a name, and they have a specific uh, criteria for the naming. So it should be done topic level, or topic level and some, something else. right? So for example, if you're doing a lesson on the shell, and it's for novices, it'd be called shell novice. If you're doing Python for novices, and it has a specific example inside, which is inflammation, it would be Python novice inflammation. Anybody can own lessons. There's no, there's no restrictions on that. Um, you clone it locally. Uh, well, just be careful that you're not already in a Git repo. Um, and this, this uh, if you're familiar with Git, you'll, see, you'll know that, that this, this command uh, makes a Git, clones it directly into a GitHub pages branch. Uh, it, it uses Jekyll. So that's why if you, um, once you upload it to, to GitHub, GitHub will automatically create the web page for you. Um, so you can edit it. Um, there's a readme inside that gives you some general instructions. And there's lesson layouts and notes and, and a fact inside as well, which are common questions that people have. Uh, in the template, there's the page layout, uh, CSS, images, and the validation tool as well. Uh, in the example, it has lots of example lessons files uh, and descriptions of what's required and how you do things. So what are the formatting rules? It's just Markdown, uh, well, a super set of Markdown. But basically, it's designed to be as simple as possible for, for, for people to write. Um, occasionally, they update the template. And so that's why it's a good idea to add it as a remote so that you can automatically integrate those changes very easily. Uh, they chose Markdown because things like IPython notebooks are really difficult to diff uh, and merge then, so if you see any changes in them. Um, other formats, so, so we use this a bit in, in Ecamm, is restructured text, but that's really only for the Python community. Um, so they, that's why they chose Markdown. The template has some couple of subdirectories, which are just for the layouts and some HTML stuff inside. The required files are an index, which is going to be the home page of, of the lesson, uh, a discussion, which is just some general discussion about the lesson, 
an instructor's guide, which is for people who are actually giving the lesson to give some, some common things that occur and some, some points to note. And then a reference guide for the, for the learners as well, so, so, the, so, so that they know where to go next um, after, they've, after they've done the lesson. Each lesson is, um, is numbered and then has a particular topic. And each of the topics should really be only about 10 to 15 minutes long. The idea being that, that in that time window, you start thinking about um, doing hands-on. Right? So you, if you keep the topics to that kind of time frame, and then you also think about hands-on, they match. Right? So that you match these, these, these topics to, to, uh, to hands-on as well. Uh, the, the lesson themselves are for the instructors and for, off, and for offline reference, right? You shouldn't show them to the learners during the lesson, right? So the idea is that these are, these are for the person who's giving the lesson and for the learners after they've done the lesson, right? So for offline reference. And um, I, like I say, I'd be curious to know why that's the case, but um, I know it helps people. To, so otherwise people jump ahead, I guess, is the main reason. But I don't really know the reason why they do it like that or why they don't give, tell people in advance, but that's how it's done. Um, the, there are a couple of subdirectories uh, for each lesson. One that contains the, any source code that you have, so any required data files, and then a fig, fig directory for, for images. There's a list of existing lessons that, that are the, the, the mature ones that are publicly available. They're all on the Software Carpentry website. And there's a lot, actually, more lessons that are, you know, in, in the pipeline. And there, there you, can, you can find a lot of those on GitHub. Um, and they would say that, you know, if you're going to start working on a lesson, it's good to let them know so they can advertise it to people, let people know that you're working on something. Because then if they advertise it, people might actually contribute, right? That's the idea, that people will collaborate on a lesson. So I, I'm actually coming to the end now. Uh, what about the HPC space? So are, are people thinking about this? Yes, people are thinking about it a, a, quite a bit at present. Um, and there is already kind of at least an organization, a loose organization on, on GitHub called HPC Carpentry. And they have a little website and they've done a few lessons already. Um, it's not like officially sanctioned at the moment, so this is something that's being discussed. Um, but, but they do have lessons in the wild, there's stuff out there already. Um, which is just an introduction to, to, to HPC uh, analysis with Python um, using SnakeMake, and then parallel computing with, with Chapel in particular, right? So now the thing is that there's a reason that this stuff is not sanctioned yet because a lot of people might disagree with these choices, right? So whatever about the novice lesson, this is the thing. The first thing to do is to get the novice lesson because more or less people can agree on, on these things. But once you start going these two other paths, there could potentially be a lot of uh, there's a lot to discuss, right? Um, and so these are the things that have been done. So there's, there's that HPC Carpentry organization, and there's another novice HPC lesson that's out in the wild as well. Um, there, was a bird of, there was a BOF session at the last supercomputing conference, and, but the way I see things, there's a lot of these site specifics in the HPC space that make collaboration a little bit harder, right? So access, um, schedulers, environments, they all need to be tweaked. And so that makes, makes it difficult for people to collaborate on a single lesson. And so that's one of the things that we need to address. Uh, this, so in, in the last call for Centers of Excellence, there was uh, this, this coordination and support action as well. What I felt could happen there is that we could, we could look at application-specific lessons for HPC. So after we've done a novice lesson to introduce people to the machine. We could think about teaching people how to use a particular application on an HPC system, right? So it's saying they already know the application themselves, but how do they use it well on an HPC system? Right, especially on the extreme scale ones, right? So how do I enable the GPU functionality? How do I build that? How do I run it? How do I, what is it good for? What is it not good for? These type of things. So that, that, they were lessons that I thought might, might be interesting for, for centers of excellence. And that's something that, that we will discuss at the first Carpentry Conference, which is in Dublin, in Dublin uh, at the end of May. And there's two sessions related to HPC there. 
I'm helping to organize one, which is the breakout session on, on the second day of the conference. And then there's also a workshop on the third day where we'll, we'll try, the goal, at least for now, is to try and help mature this, this HBC novice lesson and get people in the room. So there's a lot of interest, especially in the US. They have a lot of interest in, in, in this. And so also, in, oh well, also here in Europe as well, there was quite a few people at the, at the Bird of a Feather session in, 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 at SC17. And so that group will get together again, including some more people that and we're trying to encourage more people to come along as well. But that's in Dublin um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of May. And yeah, that's it.